um, we're going to be going to the new level red and that is coming up and I'm sure we're going to hear about that. But with that, um, Leanne Jalon, Director of San Juan Basin Public Health, are you going to lead us off? Yeah, I'd like to start with some um, opening remarks and then Brian has uh, slides and some more detailed um, you know, information. But I, I do wanna just thank everybody for giving us the opportunity to visit this morning. We're not here with great news. We realize that uh, this is difficult. It is difficult for all of us. Um, I was just chuckling with about the 40 minute Zoom thing because I thought, well, maybe some people would like 40 minute off buttons for some people that you have to have Thanksgiving with. And then, um, but, you know, uh, it is not fair that our Thanksgivings are not gonna be the normal Thanksgivings that we want. Even if we do have some family members that we wish we could turn off, we all do uh, love our families, appreciate people that are in our lives and need to get through this pandemic intact in ways that we can okay. commune with our family members, um, have kids in school, have paychecks, and also have community services that are functioning. We're uh, working into uh, healthcare capacity shortages, but we're also seeing critical workforce shortages across the state in first responders, fire, dispatch, ambulance services, right? Because the burden of disease becomes so high in a community that there are too many sick people in all kinds of workforces. So some of the information that um, Brian is going to show you has stats for where we are across the state. We have communities with more than one out of 50 people currently infectious. It becomes really hard for the community to function when the rates are that high. Colorado, I think in Brian's slides will be shown as like the 12th or 15th top transmission state for the country. Uh, that's an old number. We believe we're in the top 10 now. So that's about a week old. So that's how quickly it's moving in Colorado and how quickly it's moving in the wrong direction. So, uh, you know, we as a community are not on the leading edge of this. We're on the trailing edge of this. That said, uh, we're not an island. We, you know, we commune with uh, all kinds of state services, uh, you know, people, you know, traveling for work and, and, and college kids moving around and people moving around. So when the state has this high prevalence of disease, it becomes harder and harder for us to be on the trailing edge. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, we caught up to the rest of the state. So it uh, it is uh, it is a difficult time. We also believe as a community that we really can turn it around more quickly, right? So we're not an island, we're affected by what goes on around us, but we have seen as a community our ability to come together and do the right things. And this has not grown so out of control here yet. A lot of what we're dealing with is a post-Halloween spike that just continued to grow. If we're really careful and really do the right things, we have the opportunity to get back to where we were in just a couple of weeks. And that's what we're asking you to do. There are programs available. One of the things is, is if you move into this higher restriction first, and you know we're, we're, we're one of the first counties to do it, um, and that's because our numbers say we have to. We're almost 800 cases per 100,000 residents over 14 days. The standard is 350. That means you're going to run out of health care, right? So we're almost three, no, two and a half times that, almost three times that. So here's the thing. When the state does its special legislative session that they are calling, they will prioritize relief, state relief. Well, obviously, the federal relief is a whole other ball of wax that no one has cracked yet. But the state relief will prioritize the hardest hit businesses in the highest restriction communities. So when we hit like 800 cases and moved into this severe risk, our businesses, if this next legislative session goes uh, well, will be first in line for this relief package. So I hope that is something to uh, get hope to, hope to get us through. I think we've seen these relief packages come through. We've seen them work well. Unfortunately, the feds are not leading on this, uh, but this is what the state is doing is the interim and we'll see what happens next. But I just wanted to kind of do the introduction, which says, look, it's, you know, it's really bad. When Colorado is the top 10 or 12 state for transmission across the country, and we are seeing healthcare overwhelmed across the state, and we are seeing communities not have ambulance drivers, not have dispatch, not have first responders, we have to act, and we're gonna try to act quickly and do it well and get back to something that we can all live with, because this is gonna be hard. 
And if we're not successful, then the whole state's going to end up having to go to that next level. And I think, I don't know if people, I don't know how much of the information we have about the levels, Brian, but there is another level after this that looks like March and April. We don't want that to happen. So I think that's all I'm going to say is my intro, and then uh, we'll work through the slides. Thanks, Leanne, for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Devine. I'm the Environmental Health Director at San Juan Basin Public Health. We are your local public and environmental health agency. I'm also serving as our Deputy Incident Commander for the COVID-19 response here in La Plata County, as well as in Archuleta County. Um, I do have some slides to go through. Jack, I wasn't sure if I should be giving the short version or long version of this presentation. I know the calendar invite was for an hour, but I don't know how much of that is our time. Um, basically, I would leave probably about 10, 15 minutes um, for questions. So if you've got about 35 minutes. Great. <clears throat> that works out perfectly. Okay. And I'm going to do share screen here. <clears throat> uh, resize so I can see all of you. Can I just get a thumbs up from somebody that you can see my slideshow? Several thumbs ups. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to do today is uh, basically just take you through our COVID-19 containment strategy um, and some statistics from each of our uh, operational strategies and how things are going uh, in each one. Then at the end, um, I've got some uh, information kind of about the long-term uh, long planning that we're doing. Um, this week, our emphasis for the community is uh, twofold. First, we have activated the emergency operation centers in both of our counties. Um, this is what we do when we need assistance, formal assistance from our partner agencies in different ways. I'll talk about uh, what those ways are at the end of the presentation. Um, but this is the first time we've had to activate the emergency operations centers since March and April. So that's your first sign that things have become quite serious. We were able to manage essentially with our internal team over the course of the summer. Um, starting around Halloween uh, with an increase in cases, uh, we have had to request formal assistance from our emergency operations center partners and they've responded. Um, so they are active and open. I'll talk about some of what they're doing. The other emphasis for this week is a call to action across the whole of government and the whole of community. We have the statutory authority at San Juan Basin Public Health to respond to communicable diseases. We do it all day, every day, and most of the time, uh, we are able to do it without all of you even knowing that we're there. Um, we have tools to manage communicable disease in the community all the time. Uh, obviously, this communicable disease, COVID-19, is a little bit different. It's more widespread, there's no natural immunity, and it's a pretty nasty virus that spreads um, sometimes without symptoms and yet makes a lot of people really sick and is fatal, um, can be fatal. So what we're calling for this week is a whole of government response um, in the same way that we would have a whole of government response in a major wildfire or other natural disaster. Uh, we need a whole of government response to uh, this pandemic, which is what we are, uh, which is what we're calling for. And we, as I said, we have activated the emergency operations centers to help us do that. It's also necessary that everybody in the community treats this as an emergency response and treats themselves as part of our emergency response. In a pandemic, the choices that everybody makes in the community add up. They're really small choices. They might seem like they don't make a difference, but they add up. And because this virus spreads with exponential growth, small changes across all of society go a really long way um, when they're carried forward over a matter of even just a couple of weeks. And you'll see that come out in some of the data. Um, but what we wanna emphasize for everybody is you are all part of our emergency response here with the choices that you make in your workplaces and in your social life, um, you are responding to this incident as well, and it's time um, for everybody to uh, take that just as seriously as we do in our work days in public health. Our strategy for containing this disease is threefold. Um, it's a containment strategy that's based on identifying the disease, uh, containing it through control measures, and slowing its spread in the community more generally. So that's uh, surveillance, which is a fancy word for testing, and other types of disease monitoring. 
That's disease investigation and control, which is our uh, investigations of individual cases, uh, where those cases might have been acquired, where people might have acquired the virus, and who they've been in contact with, so who they may have spread it to in the meantime. And then control measures like quarantine and isolation orders uh, that try to separate infectious people and potentially infectious people from society as a whole. These are the two strategies that we use for uh, communicable disease all the time, again, without anybody ever knowing about it. Um, you know, people get tested when they have certain symptoms uh, at a medical provider. Uh, those conditions are automatically reported to public health when they're diagnosed. We do a case investigation. We put people on quarantine and isolation. Um, we used to be able to do this with a staff of two people um, for our two counties. Um, at the moment, we have a staff approaching 30 um, working on these strategies. Because this virus is so widespread in our community and because there is no native immunity to it, um, we've had to add a mitigation strategy. And these are the community-based efforts to reduce the spread of the virus, reduce the number of contacts that people have, so people are less likely to acquire the virus. And if they do have it, they're going to spread it to fewer people. Um, these are the three strategies that we're using, and we remain committed to using all three uh, to manage the pandemic, even with our increase in cases. What I'm going to do is take us through basically what we've learned from each of these strategies recently and where these things seem to be heading. Starting with surveillance, which again is a fancy word for testing. We have a couple of different testing programs. Um, it's not just the, uh, the community testing uh, that's now at the La Plata County Fairgrounds, although that is the most visible. We have a lot of testing. We get information from different sources um, to understand how things are progressing with the virus. The short answer is not well. Um, these are statewide figures that you're seeing on your screen. Um, this is the percent change week over week in number of new cases reported in Colorado. You can see that it's been, uh, things have been growing in Colorado since the beginning of October. Um, as Leanne mentioned, we are on the trailing edge of the increases in Colorado. We're doing a little bit better than the rest of the state. Our increases have been uh, since late October. Um, you'll also see that we've got the percent change week over week here, and uh, it appears to be constant. You've got 47% um, the week before that, it was 48%. The week before that, it was 51%. So it kind of looks from this graph like things might be constant or slowing down. But uh, since this is week over week, you're taking 47% of a larger number uh, each week, and that means that case growth is actually accelerating. We are experiencing exponential growth here in Colorado. As I mentioned, um, as of this week, we're in just about the top 10 um, for new cases in the last seven days adjusted for population. This is a really standard metric for us. It's one of the most important, uh, we call it incidence rate. And it's simply the number of new cases identified in a certain time period adjusted for population. So this is how we compare states of different sizes. This is also how we compare counties of different sizes within Colorado. You'll see Colorado's uh, up there where we don't wanna be. I'll also point out that um, some of our neighbors, Wyoming and Utah are even a little bit ahead of us. Uh, New Mexico is also in this red category and you can see almost the entire country uh, is in very high seven day cumulative incidence adjusted for population. Unfortunately, many of our cases do turn into hospitalizations. Um, that number has been falling because uh, treatments have improved, outpatient treatments for the virus have improved. Um, so hospital admissions as a, as a proportion of cases has been going down somewhat, um, not terribly steeply, but it is less than it was in the spring, which is good news. Um, the other reason that seems to be going down is we do have more infections in younger age groups than we did in the spring, uh, or at least identified infections in younger age groups than we did in the spring. Nonetheless, hospital admissions in Colorado also increasing um, since about uh, late September. Um, and the rate here does seem to go up and down. It does fluctuate. Um, that rate has uh, slowed just a little bit in the last week or so, um, but really hard to draw any conclusions as to why that might be. Um, the problem with hospitalizations, of course, is that it's a trailing indicator. Um, once you have an increase in hospitalizations that threatens your healthcare capacity, you're guaranteed to get more hospitalizations because there are other cases out there that haven't yet needed to be hospitalized. So um, hospitalizations is both a metric that we look at to understand cases that haven't been identified through testing, 
It's also a metric that trails those cases such that um, if we rely only on hospitalizations, we're gonna be late in reacting to uh, developments with the virus. The state uses hospitalizations um, to estimate a variable called transmission control or TC on this graph. Transmission control is um, a metric of how well we're doing to slow down the spread of the virus. If transmission control were 0%, the virus would be spreading as it naturally does through the human population with no public health efforts. At 100% transmission control, no one would spread it to anybody else and the virus would disappear. Um, over the last week, state estimates that that has improved by about four points from 61% to 65%. That's because of the slowed growth in hospitalizations. That's what they use to calculate that. Um, that's an improvement, that's good. Um, it's not good enough. The state's target for avoiding overuse of the healthcare system is between 80 and 90% transmission control, which is one of the reasons uh, that counties around the state are implementing additional public health orders, capacity restrictions, um, and closure orders in order to uh, improve transmission control by reducing the number of people that you come into contact with. The other metric we look at in surveillance is called positivity. This is the ratio of positive diagnostic tests to total diagnostic tests. Um, so just the number of positive tests divided by the total number of tests. This is not a good indicator of the overall prevalence of disease in the community. Um, well, it is, but not directly. So you see on this that the state's average positivity right now is 12.6%. Um, that does not mean that 12.6% of people in Colorado are currently positive, of course, because people who actually show up to get tested are more likely to actually be positive because they either have symptoms or they've been notified that they may have been exposed. What we use positivity for is an indication of whether we have enough testing available. When positivity rate goes up, that indicates that your test site is getting really full of people who are sick, uh, and some people are not able to make it in for testing. Uh, our goal is to keep positivity rate below 5%, uh, and as you see here, the states has been rising um, considerably. It's been above 5% since early October. Um, and is now at 12.6. This is another area where we're better situated than the rest of the state. I'll show you our positivity in a moment, but it's, um, it's closer to six or 7%. Um, still higher than we'd like it. We want it to be below five, um, but we are better situated in terms of testing opportunities than the rest of the state. So that was the statewide data. I'm gonna show you some local data now. Um, this is a snapshot from our website, sjbpublichealth.org slash coronavirus should be your uh, number one resource for the information and statistics that you're looking for about the disease. You can see since uh, about Halloween, we've had a really sharp increase in the number of new cases in La Plata County, which is the purple line. Um, and we now have 897 total positive cases in La Plata County. That's total since March. So that's not the number of active cases necessarily. Um, but you can see that, that almost all of those have been in the last couple of weeks. And we have had uh, three deaths among cases. All three of those were La Plata County residents. Um, and we've had 16 outbreaks. Uh, an outbreak is defined as two or more cases uh, associated with a particular facility, which could be a business, could be a social event, um, could be a special event. Um, two or more cases uh, in a period that indicates probable transmission between the cases at that facility. Just to put these uh, numbers in a different way or in a different uh, terms, um, between March and uh, Halloween, we had 489 cases in seven months. Um, this is La Plata and Archuleta counties combined. Since then, we've had 526 cases in the last 18 days. So if things um, seem like they're getting more serious and you're hearing a lot more about COVID than you did over the summer, this would be why. As I mentioned, we're in a slightly better position uh, than the rest of the state as far as surveillance goes. Um, our positivity data are between six and 7%, um, although you see that uh, we were considerably below 5% in both of our counties. Um, and that has been rising at the same time that our cases have been increasing. So we always get the question, well, don't you have more cases just because you're offering more testing? Uh, the answer is no, because the positivity rate is also going up. Um, so no, it's not simply because we've made more testing available. What we are going to do is add testing opportunities. Um, we have a couple of promising things going on that front. 
in order to um, make sure that everybody who needs a test can get a test. We're also working on adding asymptomatic ongoing testing so that people in certain occupations um, can uh, identify disease uh, before they become symptomatic or get notified of an exposure. Our diagnostic testing sites, um, we continue to operate uh, in cooperation with our EOC partners and our healthcare partners, the community testing site in Durango, that's now at the La Plata County Fairgrounds, uh, Monday through Thursday and Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, the intent of this site is to be a no barrier test site for anybody who is um, symptomatic or notified of an exposure um, or, or even informally notified of an exposure or thinks they've been exposed. Um, so we want anybody who believes they need a test to go get tested at this site. Um, we also have a pop-up testing site in Bayfield tomorrow, 9 a.m. to noon, uh, with Upper Pine River Fire Protection District Admin Building in cooperation with Upper Pine and some other partners. Uh, there's also private testing available. I've got Cedar Diagnostics listed on here. Um, we do not have a comprehensive list of all testing locations. There are other um, private testing opportunities out there, um, but this is the one that a lot of people are using um, when they need a test for a specific purpose as opposed to for community testing. And all this is also on that same website, sjbpublichealth.org slash coronavirus. Um, as I mentioned, we're working to add testing opportunities. Um, the first form of that is uh, asymptomatic serial testing. Uh, this is for qualified partners who have in-person contact with members of the public. So um, our highest risk occupations, um, first responders, um, critical services, uh, our schools uh, and some of, some healthcare workers. Um, we have types of testing now that are approved for this purpose as approved to just approved for community testing. So we're trying to get those into the rotation, um, get people to uh, who are eligible to sign up for asymptomatic serial testing. I don't know if uh, any of these qualified partners um, would be members of Durango Chamber or not, um, but uh, certainly those uh, those partners who are critical services and in regular contact with the public, we are going to be reaching out to them and enrolling them in asymptomatic serial testing. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is we're testing in general is um, it, it seems obvious when you say it out loud, but testing is just a snapshot in time. Um, it is not a complete security blanket and it's not a substitute for good public health practices. So, you know, we have all heard stories and it's come up in our case investigations. Well, I went to that party because I had a negative test. Well, right, but then you went to the party. So somebody else there may have been positive or it may have been a false negative result. Um, so um, testing, whether that's serial testing or community testing or anything else, um, is not a substitute for um, good public health practices. That's my summary of uh, what we're learning through our surveillance data. Um, I'm now gonna talk about um, what we've learned and where things are going in disease investigation and control. Again, our tactics here are case investigation, so case interviews and contact tracing, and then a notification to contacts, and then we place cases on isolation and contacts on quarantine. Um, commensurate with the increase in cases identified, we've also had an increase in our investigation and control workload. So uh, in uh, the early summer, we were doing something like 30 contacts a week because we had about 10 cases a week and we had two to three contacts per case. At times that was a little bit higher than that. Um, so let's call it 30 to 50 case investigations in one week, case or contact investigations in one week. Um, this month we've been up in the neighborhood of 75 cases in a day and because people are now working in person schools have been open and people have been socializing in person our average contacts per case is now up to 10. Uh, that means we now have 750 people to contact per day. Um, we've been trying to streamline and automate as much of this as we can um, but there's no real substitute for um, actual public health investigation. Um, there was a lot of talk of um, how we could automate the entire contact tracing process. We still do use some of those tools. Um, for example, uh, many of you may have received a notification for the Colorado Exposure Notification app. Um, this is an app that goes on your phone. It's available from both uh, Google and Apple uh, app stores. Um, and what it does is it exchanges an anonymous um, token, basically a randomized series of letters and numbers with other phones that it's within 15 or within six feet of for 15 minutes. Um, and it does this without ever collecting your name 
your uh, phone number or the locations where those interactions took place. So all it's doing is a phone talking to another phone. Then when somebody uh, tests positive um, and that we're doing the case investigation, we ask, do you have this app on your phone? Um, if they say yes, then we give them basically a code to input um, with the dates uh, that they uh, may have been infectious. And it automatically sends a notification to all of the other phones that it associated with during that relevant period. Um, so that you get a notification on your phone, again, without knowing where this occurred or um, who you were in contact with, um, that you may have been exposed. And at the moment, all it does is tell you to call your local public health agency, um, which is not a bad thing, um, but they're gonna be doing an update to it soon that will actually give you um, testing instructions and quarantine uh, instructions. Um, so that will help our workload a lot. Um, we do want people to add uh, that app to their phone. It's certainly not a uh, silver bullet. Uh, it doesn't replace traditional case investigation and testing, um, but it does help kind of at the margins. Um, you can find this in the Google and Apple uh, app stores. You can also go to addyourphone.com um, in order to add this app onto your phone. Um, and we do, uh, ask people to do that. Again, it's not the, the centerpiece of our strategy, but it does help us out kind of around the margins. Um, the only other thing I'll say here with contact tracing is, um, people always ask, where are people acquiring the disease? You know, how did this case get it? How did this case get it? We have widespread community transmission here in La Plata County, as we do everywhere in the country at the moment. So the short answer is most of the time we don't know. Um, but we are able to identify possible transmission routes, um, and in so doing, um, we're able to come up with, um, let's call them some patterns or some commonalities for the uh, cases that we've seen, uh, especially since Halloween, um, where we have a lot more data to draw from, unfortunately. Um, the, the first commonality uh, is social gatherings, um, private social gatherings. Um, We've had Halloween parties come up by name. We've had um, watching sports with other people come up by name in our investigations. Um, but essentially it's uh, indoor activities where people remove their face covering. So um, you invite some people over for a Halloween party. You keep one household on that side of the room and the other household on this side of the room, um, but you're eating snacks and uh, you're drinking. And so you do have your face covering off and indoors, even if you're more than six feet apart, if you don't not wearing a face covering and you're in the same room as another person for a long enough period of time, that's gonna be a transmission route. So that's been the first uh, commonality or pattern is, uh, is those private social gatherings. The second has been workplace exposures. Again, generally indoors and uh, in vehicles, um, not wearing face coverings. So I think we've done a really good job as a community of setting the expectation that in a, in a front facing, in a customer serving space, um, everybody's gonna be wearing face coverings. People know to expect that. Um, obviously we have a couple of notable exceptions, um, but we have generally set that expectation uh, widely in the community. In back of house spaces and in shared transportation, you know, from job site to job site, we see face covering compliance go way down. I think because people say, ah, there's nobody here bugging me about it. Um, and it's just me and these other guys that I see all the time, right? So um, we do see that as a probable transmission route for a large number of cases. The last one that I'll point out is um, this phenomenon of pods. Um, probably you, a lot of you are familiar with this. It's basically saying, um, hey, we work together and we socialize together. We see each other all the time. Um, so why don't we um, treat ourselves as one large household? Um, we're not gonna wear face coverings. Uh, we're gonna hang out together all the time. And we just won't come into contact with anybody else. That way the virus will not get into the pod and we don't have to worry about it. Well, obviously that doesn't work. Uh, one of your friends is hanging out without you uh, or um, their kid is getting it in another setting uh, when they're hanging out with somebody and they're bringing it into the pod. When we get rid of those public health precautions in that setting, the disease spreads really, really fast. Um, so I think it's human nature to try to come up with a little bit of normalcy and say, well, we'll just kind of treat ourselves as, a, as an extended household here. Um, that's a recipe to spread a lot of disease really far. With that in mind, because of how widespread it is, as I said, we do have to rely on a mitigation strategy as well. Um, so mitigation is intended to slow community transmission 
uh, or break the chain of community transmission by reducing the number of people that uh, people are in contact with so the disease is spread less widely. Um, the way we do this in Colorado is called the dial. Um, you've probably all seen various versions of the dial. It's been updated a bunch of times. This is the most recent version as of tomorrow. Um, the dial basically, the idea behind the dial is um, county by county, we're going to have the mitigation restrictions, the public health orders that are in effect, be tied to the underlying data about transmission in that county. So uh, if you have um, a lot of new cases, if your positivity rate is really high, you're going to move to the right on this dial. Uh, if transmission is slowed through public health measures and through uh, disease control, uh, transmission slows, positivity goes down, hospitalizations are looking good, you're going to move to the left on this dial. And we don't make those decisions um, lightly or rapidly. We don't want to do that based on one day's worth of data, of course. Um, generally, we're looking at the last 7 to 14 days of data when deciding what public health measures are appropriate um, for disease mitigation. Um, the, what's the, the, the metric that's really driving the bus here is, uh, is our incidence rate. And for this purpose, we use a 14-day incidence rate um, in Colorado. And as you can see, almost the entire state is red on this map, uh, meaning that uh, level red uh, severe risk restrictions are appropriate for that county. Um, there's a handful of counties still in orange. Um, this is a couple of days old now, so I imagine there's fewer orange now than there were. Um, there's a couple of counties still in orange, and then there's a few in green. You're probably wondering what are the green counties doing so well that nobody else is doing? Uh, the answer is nobody lives there. Um, I'm being a little bit glib. I hope nobody here is from Silverton and got annoyed by me saying that. Um, it's, uh, it, there are counties with the smallest population. They have very little testing uh, done on a daily basis. Um, and in fact, if they're small enough, they have an entirely different metric to be listed in green or entirely different thresholds to be listed in green here because, you know, um, two cases in San Juan County is, is huge when compared to their population. Um, so the short answer for green is that those are the, the smallest counties on the map. Um, I'm going to skip over Archuleta County here uh, and just go to La Plata County. Um, we've got these thresholds for 14-day uh, cumulative incidents, um, and you can see we are well above the threshold for severe risk. Um, you can also see that we only crossed that threshold uh, about, uh, it was about 10 days ago, actually, I think, 10, 11, maybe 12 days ago. Um, that we actually cross the threshold for severe risk. This just indicates um, when transmission accelerates, when it gets into exponential growth, it just keeps rising. Um, we would have to have a pretty significant turnaround um, for these numbers to drop back down. Um, and that's why mitigation measures are uh, appropriate here in La Plata County. You can see um, you know, how quickly we accelerated from uh, concern all the way up to uh, more than twice as high as the severe risk threshold. So this is what's in effect in La Plata County at the moment. Um, level orange, high risk. Um, you don't need to squint and try to read everything on this slide. This is also available on our website. Um, but in general, uh, most of our establishments are at 25% um, capacity. Um, and again, this is to reduce the number of people that you're in close contact with. Um, because we've been above that severe risk threshold for a number of days, um, and because we're uh, trying to prevent uh, overuse of the healthcare system, uh, we'll be moving La Plata County tomorrow to level red, which is severe risk. I don't have, um, the state has not, because level red is brand new, um, the state has not produced this slide uh, for level red, so I don't have the exact same slide to show you. But what I do have is um, some of the major changes. So obviously the, the, the most important change is going to be a prohibition on private social gatherings outside of your household. Um, I'll say that again. That's a prohibition on private social gatherings outside of your household. That includes social gatherings that are outdoors. That includes social gatherings uh, where you can maintain six foot of distance. That includes social gatherings where you are wearing a face covering. Um, we really need people to not be in contact with people outside of their household at this time. And we know that in private social gatherings, um, you even if you're doing a really good job for the first half of the gathering, um, it's your compliance is gonna slip a little bit uh, as that gathering proceeds. 
Uh, the second major change is a prohibition on indoor on-premise dining at restaurants. Um, this is a really tough one. There is a lot of evidence of transmission um, at indoor dining. Uh, of course, when you're dining indoors, um, you're around people that are not members of your household and you're generally not wearing a face covering for an extended period of time. Um, Takeout curbside delivery options uh, still very much available for restaurants. We encourage everyone to take advantage of those services. We really wanna be supporting our local uh, businesses as they go through this difficult time. Um, it's also uh, gonna be acceptable for uh, open air on-premise service to continue. So uh, outdoor dining, patio dining, still acceptable at restaurants, um, but it's gonna be one household group per table. Um, so we do encourage people to um, uh, dine only, actually require people to dine only with members of their household. Um, last call is also moved to 8 p.m. Uh, and that's because we know that uh, compliance with face coverings and with socializing with members of your own household does go down later at night, especially when alcohol is involved. Um, the other major changes here are around um, percent capacity. Um, oh, except for indoor events. So indoor special events uh, and indoor entertainment uh, had been at 25% capacity, um, those will now be closed. Uh, this is another situation where you're indoors with people uh, who are not members of your household and maybe people that you don't even know for an extended period of time. Uh, you may be eating and drinking during the special events, so your face covering is coming off. Um, and so indoor special events are going to be closed under this level as well. As far as the others, um, these are lower risk activities. Um, Office-based businesses, um, you can keep a face covering on. Uh, I'm working from home today, so I'm not wearing my face covering while presenting to you. Um, gyms and fitness centers, uh, really, really low capacity limits here. But again, face coverings can be worn uh, during fitness activities and must be worn. Um, we're also requiring reservations at gyms and fitness centers under this level to ensure that that capacity limit is not uh, breached. Um, outdoor events, uh, you'll see that there's no change there. Um, that's because, again, outdoor events are much lower risk. Um, we are continuing to allow outdoor special events and outdoor entertainment. Um, it does say that uh, you can only attend these uh, with members of your household group. So you can have um, 75 people at your special event, um, but uh, people should be moving through the special event or in a little um, grouping within the special event only with members of their own household, and those household units need to be six feet apart from each other. Again, um, the idea here is we need to really, really focus on the highest transmission routes, um, and that's what the purpose of this new level red is to do. Um, previously, the only thing we could do after uh, the level orange restrictions was a complete stay at home order. Um, and that targets uh, the entire community when we know transmission is much more likely in these indoor settings where face coverings are not worn. So that's the idea is to break the chain of transmission in those settings. That's what I've got to say about mitigation. Um, just a, a, a couple of slides before I finish. Um, we have activated the emergency operations centers in both counties. Um, for four purposes. Um, we need support with our um, surveillance program, so we're asking them to uh, help us um, staff some of these testing sites um, in order to have more testing available, bring that positivity rate back down. Um, number two, we've activated um, support for uh, disease control. So when we place people on quarantine and isolation orders, they uh, often have logistical needs housing um, and other kinds of resources in order to successfully quarantine or isolate themselves. So we're asking for the EOC's help in doing that. Uh, enforcement, obviously when you create public health mitigation orders, um, they have to be enforced. And so we're asking for the EOC's support in enforcing those orders. And then finally, uh, medical surge planning. Um, the reason that we have to be so concerned um, is about uh, about our trajectory right now is not just because we know that cases are widespread, um, but it's because uh, we're starting to lose um, critical workforce at critical services um, due to exposures in critical services, and we're starting to risk overuse of our healthcare system. Um, that's what we call a medical surge. Um, we have a medical surge plan for our regional system um, from back in the spring. Uh, we are working with our partners to update that uh, and ensure that um, we have the capability to add uh, medical treatment capacity should that become necessary here in Southwest Colorado. 
Um, just a couple of slides in on what's been in the news, because um, I imagine there would be some questions about it. There's been a lot of uh, discussion recently about vaccine preparation. Um, the early news is indeed encouraging about vaccines that are in development, um, but I, I think it's human nature to focus on the good news here and not think about some of the implications. Um, some of the implications are uh, even if we are in receipt of vaccine here in Southwest Colorado, um, shortly after the new year, which we do expect, um, it's going to take an awful lot of time to vaccinate enough people to where we don't have to rely on surveillance, disease investigation and control, and mitigation, um, which means vaccination is not going to replace our other strategies. It's going to add to them. And that means here in our whole of government, whole of community response, the availability of vaccine is actually going to add to our workload. It's not going to make it easier, at least in the short term. Um, so we are uh, waiting for, uh, we are planning for a uh, delivery of vaccine here to Southwest Colorado shortly after the new year. Um, we anticipate that it will take um, up to more than a year uh, in order to vaccinate the uh, required number of people such that we don't have to rely on these other strategies for COVID-19. Any more than we do for any other communicable disease, I should say. Um, I think we should expect that um, the coronavirus will be with us forever. Um, and it will be a, a communicable disease that we manage just like all of the other ones that we manage in the background um, at some point. State is taking a phased distribution approach to vaccine because we do anticipate it's going to be um, quite a long time before we have vaccine available for the general public. Um, the top priorities in the state scheme are um, healthcare workers and first responders. Um, these are the people who are generally exposed to the highest viral loads because they're interacting with very sick people. Um, and obviously there are critical services that we cannot afford to lose. Um, also in the first phase are going to be the highest risk individuals, which are going to be our residents of um, assisted living, long-term care, and uh, nursing facilities. Um, the second phase is our congregate housing and our essential workers. Um, so this is going to be um, people with, uh, in working in essential businesses and services with direct interaction with the public. Um, and uh, residents of congregate housing who are at higher risk. Um, also in that phase will be our um, older adults and adults with underlying conditions. Uh, and then finally, the third phase is the general public. My last slide, uh, obviously we're one week before Thanksgiving. Um, as Leanne mentioned, it's really unfortunate that, um, that we're not able to have uh, the Thanksgiving that we've come to expect. Um, I think it's really fair for people to be upset about that. Um, as we said, this is now a whole of government, whole of community response to this emergency. People need to do their part as an emergency responder and they need to um, follow the uh, public health orders that are in place in their community and uh, general guidance. Um, we think this is an opportunity for people to be creative about Thanksgiving celebrations. Um, to have uh, dinner only with your own your household um, and to interact virtually with people outside your household. Um, this is the guidance that we're hoping uh, people will follow. Um, and again, um, we're at a, at a really severe risk here in La Plata County. Um, that, that term on the state's dial is well chosen um, and people need to um, do their part to uh, keep the community safe um, by um, abiding by our public health orders and by, um, in general, uh, celebrating Thanksgiving in a responsible way. Uh, I've seen a bunch of activity in the chat. This is the last thing I want to share other than, again, we do have um, quite a bit of resources available at our website, um, as well as the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment uh, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, including holiday guidance there, um, Thanksgiving ideas, um, and of course we have our testing locations, uh, what to do if you think you're sick, what to do if you think you may have been exposed, what to do if you think one of your employees may have been exposed. Um, all that information is on our website and we do update our website daily. So we have the most up-to-date information there. Thank you, Brian. Um, appreciate that. Uh, would it be best just, uh, you want to open up the chat and kind of go through and sure. answer them? I think that I've seen you do that in the past and you do a great job fielding those. So if you want to 
Let's take a look at them, and we can have you go down through. Sure, I'll just uh, I'll just start from the beginning. Um, Matthew Gomez asks, I was told that in La Plata County there is an exemption for mask wearing if you work in a federal, state, or county building. Uh, is that true? Uh, if it's true, why is that? Uh, it's not true. Um, there is no exemption for wearing a face covering um, unless you're uh, essentially doing um, an activity where you can't wear the face covering. Um, but even then, there's there's other requirements there to prevent you from transmitting the disease to other people. No, there's no exemption to um, face covering orders based on the type of workplace. Um, Lisa Govro asks, is the library no longer a testing site? And I think I saw that answered somewhere else in the uh, chat. Um, and so uh, we did move the community testing site from the uh, library to the La Plata County Fairgrounds. Um, does Mercy still offer testing? Uh, the answer there I, I think is yes and no. Um, they are not operating a community testing site at Mercy Regional Medical Center anymore, um, but obviously they're still testing um, people who need to be admitted to hospital. They uh, test their staff, uh, things like that. Um, how does the new level affect hotels? Um, hotels are considered a critical business. Um, and so they are uh, under the same restrictions that they have been under. Um, but we of course uh, are advising every workplace, including hotels to move as much of the workforce into uh, remote work, work from home as possible. Um, but there are no capacity limits uh, on lodging uh, because that is considered an essential service. Uh, next question I see is, do our numbers include visitors to Durango and La Plata County? I did have that on a slide. Um, we do track those separately, and the reason for that is we still have to do a case investigation and um, contact notification. Um, so we do report that because that is a big part of our workload. Um, over the summer, uh, we had about as many out-of-jurisdiction cases as we had resident cases. That is obviously no longer the case. So La Plata non-residents, um, we've had 78 non-resident cases. Uh, that is since June 1st, um, and those are increasing at a much slower rate um, than uh, the La Plata residence number is increasing. Um, let's see, Lynn asks, is statistical information gathered and does contact tracing occur for those who are not tested at a local facility? So Lynn, do you mean like people who might be tested in Farmington, um, people who might be tested um, in Cortez, places like that? I was thinking about uh, private testing. So if you order the Okay. Um, the short answer is yes, generally, but it takes longer. Um, so uh, we do get cases reported to us um, once they're associated with a La Plata or Archuleta County address um, or a La Plata or Archuleta County test site. Um, but it generally takes longer because it's usually the lab reporting it to the state and then the state referring it to us or another jurisdiction referring it directly to us. So there's some extra steps in there and it does take longer, um, but generally uh, once we confirm that those are our cases, yes, we do count them. Um, <laughs> ah, Deanne did, uh, Deanne's in here from Silverton. Hi, Deanne. Um, yes, Deanne reports that they've had eight cases in nine days. So um, this increase is not just confined um, to any one county in Colorado or, you know, any one state in the country. Um, really, really significant increases. Um, is there an option coming for a person needing testing can apply online, receive an ID number that's given to the tester, and testee can obtain their results online when they become available. Waiting to receive an email that never comes has not been helpful. Yes, we have had a lot of communications and administrative challenges with testing, especially when we changed testing labs. Uh, at our community test site a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's a good thing that we did change labs uh, because our new lab has much faster results available, um, but there has been some issues with the reporting of negative results uh, from that laboratory that we've been working through. Um, that's gotten much better over the last couple of weeks. Um, people are going to be getting uh, an email uh, and I believe a text message uh, from the laboratory um, when they have a negative result. Uh, when they have a positive result, um, we still uh, are calling all of those uh, ourselves with our staff. Um, so yes, we did have a lot of things to work through, um, you know, adding new laboratories, referring to multiple different laboratories. There's been a lot of administrative work that's gone on there. Uh, next question is, what is the threshold for moving to purple? Um, the threshold for moving to purple does not appear on these graphs because it's an entirely different type of threshold. Um, it is a threshold that says um, we have, we are at uh, extreme risk of 
I can't remember exactly how it's phrased, but it's basically extreme risk of exceeding um, healthcare capacity or losing a critical service uh, in the county. So um, the way that we think about it is, um, you know, if we're maxing out our testing capacity or our um, uh, contact tracing capacity, then we need to reduce transmission in those high transmission um, places. And that's what level red is intended to do. If, however, we're at a point where if you're in a car accident and there's not gonna be an ambulance available to come get you, then we need people to stay at home regardless of whether they're going to a high transmission or a low transmission setting. So the threshold for stay at home level purple is based on um, healthcare utilization and on the availability of critical workforce services, uh, not on number of cases uh, or positivity rate. Um, what is the office capacity for essential businesses? Um, unchanged. Um, essential businesses uh, providing an essential service are um, not under mandatory public health orders. Obviously, uh, we strongly advise all essential businesses to reduce their in-person workforce as much as possible. I work for an essential business, an essential government function, um, and we're all working from home. Um, there's a handful of us in our laboratory who are in person, uh, but that's about it. So um, we have uh, gone to all remote work. We ask that every business goes to all remote work. Um, if you can do it remote, even if it's hard, you need to do it remote. Um, this is not the time to say, well, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm an essential business, so I'll see everybody here Monday morning um, because that's what I prefer. Uh, no, this is the time to um, have your employees work from home if it's at all possible, regardless of whether you're defined as essential or not. Uh, the next question is, uh, what is our current hospital admissions and what is Mercy's capacity? I'm going to answer the second question first. Uh, Mercy capacity is a complicated question to answer, um, and it's one that we're not fully capable of answering. Um, a, the hospitals report out uh, once a day their admissions uh, and their bed availability. But there's a lot more to hospital capacity than just beds. Um, it would be a very ineffective, um, it would bear, be very ineffective for uh, a hospital to simply put people in beds and then not be able to treat any of them because they have no staff or supplies or protective equipment. Um, so hospital capacity uh, relies on all of those. Um, the report that we get from the hospitals is just admissions and beds. So what is their um, practical capacity? Uh, we don't have that on a daily basis. As far as admissions, um, we do get a daily report on that, which I don't have in this presentation, but I could definitely look up. Um, our current regional hospitalizations as of this morning's report, or as of yesterday's report rather, uh, was 13 COVID-19 positive individuals in regional hospitals. Uh, using the business capacity restrictions sheet, what business type would you think the Welcome Center falls under? Um, I, I don't know enough about the Welcome Center to answer that question. We do have a mitigation guidance team um, that you can get in contact with um, via uh, calling the numbers on our website, um, and they will be happy to see you, uh, what guidance applies to your business and talk about how to um, apply those guidances to your workplace in order to keep your employees and your visitors safe. Uh, is the 10% occupancy rule in effect also for government buildings, state, federal, and city? Um, it probably depends on the type of service provided there. There are government services that are not listed as essential, in which case uh, their office-based operations would be at 10% capacity uh, starting tomorrow. Um, but for critical services, as I said, um, they are able to operate uh, with 100% capacity, although they do have all the same restrictions everybody else does, and they are instructed to uh, reduce their in-person workforce as much as possible. Um, but obviously, we don't need to. Um, obviously, we don't need to um, have 10% of our water and sewer plant employees working in person and not have water and sewer uh, delivered to the city of Durango. Um, so, yeah, critical services do have different rules. What determines if a business is essential or not? Um, that's defined in the state public health order. Again, if you're wondering about a, your business, um, I would recommend getting in touch with our business mitigation team. Um, we also have links to the public health order. Uh, and the state website has a bunch of guidance by sector 
um, which does list out uh, you know, what businesses might be considered essential and what businesses might not. So um, we're happy to, our team is happy to consult uh, with business owners. A lot of our consulting ends up being, uh, let's open up that guidance document and see what it says. Um, there's a ton of guidance by sector uh, on the state website um, and uh, we do end up referring a lot of people there. Uh, how does a business determine its occupancy limit if that is not already posted? Great question, Tim. Um, I believe the public health orders refer to fire code. I'm aware that not every business knows its fire code capacity or maybe doesn't even have, maybe even hasn't had that determined. Um, I think general occupancy for a lot of businesses makes a lot of sense. So like if you're a hair salon and you generally have uh, eight capacity for 10 customers and 10 staff serving those customers, then you probably need um, to, you know, that's 100% capacity. Um, if you have the fire code capacity, you would certainly use it. Um, but it's also intended to, again, the, the idea here is to spread people out and reduce close contacts between people um, at workplaces. Uh, and so, you know, if you have the normal service capacity of your business or you have the fire code, um, I would, I would, if those are at all similar, uh, I would use, I wouldn't really worry too much about which one you're using. And if you have either one, I would just use it. Um, there are also some calculators on the state website as far as, um, things like special events, uh, outdoor events, um, which you can plug in the amount of square footage available and it will tell you the allowable capacity. There's no way we got the last question answered right at 11 o'clock. There's no way I'm that good. <laughs> you hit it straight on. Good job, Brian. Um, if, if anybody has any questions they need answered, um, do they reach out? I mean, are, are you available? What, what should they, uh, who should say, they reach out? I would say go to our website first. Um, like I said, we do update the website every day. Um, if you have questions, uh, I know the, 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 you know, this is a, um, a business audience. So if you have questions about, um, the restrictions in level red, um, the state website is your first stopping point there. Um, and then uh, again, if you need help, uh, applying these requirements to your own operation, um, I would, my recommendation would be to read the guidance documents that the state publishes, uh, read the public health order that actually says legally what you're required to do, uh, and then give our mitigation team a call. Um, and they'll be happy to, uh, uh, talk you through it, ensure that you've got it right. Um, and, uh, we do have a self-certification requirement in place, which is, um, businesses and events, uh, have to self-certify their compliance, uh, with public health orders. Um, and that means when you have uh, a change in operation, um, if, if a new public health order changes how you do business, then um, we do need you to self-certify again within seven days. So um, take a look at the, uh, if, if you're unaffected by the change in public health orders, we don't need you to re-self-certify just because the order has changed. Um, but if you're a business that's um, changing its uh, capacity from 25% down to 10%. You need to report um, how many people are going to be allowed on site, what procedures you're using to confirm that. Um, then you will self-certify with us again. Um, uh, except you, Deanne, you're in Silverton. So uh, you get to do whatever Becky tells you to do. Um, but uh, here in La Plata County, we do have a self-certification requirement. Um, and this is intended public health orders and guidance documents, especially back in the spring, we're pretty hard to read and pretty hard to apply to uh, a practical situation. Um, the guidance documents have got a lot better. So self-certification um, is, is pretty easy uh, to complete for most businesses at this point um, in terms of we have you read your guidance documents, we have you read the public health order, and then there's a very quick uh, web form that you fill out to tell us you know, what your capacity is, um, you know, what measures you're using for infection control, um, and how we can get in touch with you. And uh, then you certify your compliance and you're done. Well, those, uh, my, my wingman, Tim Walsworth, posted the uh, public health order in the uh, chat. Thank you, Tim. Um, well, we'll let you guys get back. A couple quick things, um, just reminders. Um, I, I'm going to uh, give a shout out again to the Business Improvement District. They're going to have an online shopping uh, program. 
Uh, so for businesses, retail services, you can uh, go to the uh, downtowndurango.org website, talk to uh, Tim and uh, Tanya, they can help you get set up for that. So a great way to do some uh, holiday shopping. Also, we partnered on the rewards program. So if you spend uh, money locally, and all, we're all about spending money locally, you can get rewards cards back uh, to area merchants. So be looking for that. Um, if you need to upgrade and update your e-commerce, uh, the Small Business Development Center just did a six-part series. And I know Mary Shepard and her crew over at the Small Business Development Center are there to help. And one more uh, plug, if you need help or want to give help, swcoda.org, which stands for Southwest Colorado Disaster Assistance, is a great website, handbook uh, that's on there. We're update, updating information. And in fact, uh, today at 3 o'clock or 3.30, we have a task force meeting. So we're working behind the scenes. So uh, Brian and Leanne, thank you both for all of your hard work. And Brian, uh, great presentation and information. So we appreciate everything that you're doing. And with that, everybody, uh, let's please do what we can to flatten the curve. I understand more and more every time I hear Brian present why this is so important. So if you can work from home as I am now, please do so. Stay safe out there and everybody have a wonderful and happy Thanksgiving. Take care.